All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second World Braille Day uh, session called Building Braille Inclusion in Libraries. So before we start, as with all online conferences, please follow good etiquette by keeping yourself on mute when you're not speaking. That's the bottom left corner of your iPhone screen, Alt-A on PC, Option-A on Mac. Use the raise hand option when you have a question, so you can double tap your name in the particip participants list on an iPhone or go into the More tab and find raise hand there. It's also Alt-Y on a PC or Option-Y on a Mac. Please save the use of the chat feature for urgent questions and comments. And uh, the information part of this session will be recorded and later posted on the Braille Literacy Canada YouTube channel. We will stop the recording prior to the question and answer period. The World Braille Day planning organizations acknowledge the historical op oppression of land, cultures, and original peoples in what we know now as Canada. We respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land and will continue to honour the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty we have made to Indigenous nations and peoples. Please take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which you live, work and play. Braille Literacy Canada, the Canadian Council of the Blind, the CNIB Foundation, the Centre for Equitable Library Access, the National Network for Equitable Library Service, and the Provincial Resource Centre for the Visually Impaired had a lot of fun working together and are pleased to deliver this series of events during the month of January in celebration of World Braille Day. And now a quote from Louis Braille himself. Access to communication in the widest sense is access to knowledge. We must be treated as equals and communication is the way we can bring this about. Braille is knowledge and knowledge is power. Our presenters today are Jen Gesso from PRCVI, Daphne Hitchcock from Braille Literacy Canada, Kai Lee from the National Network for Equitable Library Service, or NELS, Rianne LaPere, myself from NELS, and Lori Davidson from CELA. And now I'll introduce our first speaker, Daphne, to start us off. Okay, thank you, Rianne. Hello there, I'm Daphne Hitchcock. I recently retired from working in the schools as a teacher, um, uh, TDI, that is a teacher for students who are blind or with low vision. In my volunteer hours, I currently uh, work with Braille Literacy Canada. Libraries and schools go hand in hand, and today we are going to provide for you some really practical suggestions on how to build Braille inclusion into libraries. For our younger readers, we can uh, make available storybooks that are dual media. Uh, these are print braille or braille print books that when it commercially produced, the print book either has a braille page, uh, often in clear plastic, inserted into the binding, and or uh, they can be a clear braille label or stickers that are affixed to the print pages. This format uh, of print braille, braille print, uh, is great for dual media use, meaning that someone who has some usable vision can read the book, and also somebody who is reading braille can read the book together. Uh, a braille reader and or a print reader can read the same book separately or together. And this is great for everybody. Uh, think about grandparents wanting to read to their their blind grandchild, or maybe the, the parent themselves is blind and wants to share a book with their children. Uh, it's good for partner reading, it's good for individual reading, and these books are great for story times. So please welcome Jen Jessel to share an excellent example of an inclusive story time with a reading of the book, My City Speaks. Over to you, Jen. Okay, so this is a book called My City Speaks. This is a print braille book. And so it's a standard um, print book, but it has braille added on plastic overlays. Um, so that as Daphne was mentioning, uh, a print user and a braille user can read along together. Uh, this particular book is called My City Speaks and it's written by Darren LeBeau. And 
illustrated by Ashley Barron. Um, and this book has um, a, a braille overlay that displays what is in print. And in addition, it has image descriptions included in the braille. So for um, someone like myself, a braille reader who's reading aloud, um, it describes what is in the pictures. Not all print braille books will have that. So you could also um, make your own if that is not included. So I will begin reading now. This is our city. And this is a picture and it's the front entrance. Um, it's a girl in the front entrance of her home. And the girl is sitting on the stairs, putting on her shoes. And her father stands next to an open uh, door holding a violin case. And there's a mobility cane hanging on a hook near the stairs. And a purple envelope is tucked in a key hook to the right of the door. This is my city. And now the girl is using her mobility cane as she walks down this sidewalk that leads to our house. And she's waving to a neighbor who's trimming the hedge. The purple envelope is tucked under the girl's right arm and the girl's father closes the door behind her. My city moves. Um, and now the girl is at a city intersection and the girl is pressing the pedestrian crossing button. Her father stands with her. It rushes and stops and waits and goes. And now there's a picture of a um, close up of the girl's mobility cane against the textured yellow sidewalk or crosswalk indicator in the sidewalk. And the girl and her father cross the road with other pedestrians. My city opens and shuts. And there's a girl now standing on her tiptoes to place the purple envelope into a mailbox bin and her mobility cane is looped around her upper arm. It buzzes and tweets and flocks. And here there's a picture um, of a girl watering a garden in a raised bed with, um, with a uh, hose in a grassy yard. And there's bees and butterflies that are flying around the flowers. And four birds sit on a power line above. My city grows and the, uh, the girl reaches up to hold a tall blooming sunflower and bending it towards her face. And behind her, a crane moves building materials to a new building that's being built. My city is busy and the girl uh, tosses seeds to a group of 13 pigeons and relaxed. And now the girl and her father sit on a park bench and uh, the, the father is drinking coffee and the girl lays on the bench with her head on her father's lap. She's wearing headphones and the girl's mobility cane and violin case sit next to them on the bench. And one pigeon is underneath the bench. My city plays and here um, there's a white and black dog jumping to catch a flying disc and works. And here there's a dog walker with four dogs on leashes tied to their um, belt. And they're bending over to clean up from a dog who has just pooped. And one of the dogs is licking the girl's arm. It walks and runs and climbs and slides. And here there's a picture of a busy playground and the girl is sliding down a small green slide. Her father stands near the slide, holding the violin case and her mobility cane. Sometimes it's smelly. And here there's a picture of a, 
the tip of the girl's mobility cane approaching a green compost bin with a raccoon peeking out from under the lid. And there's three black garbage bags uh, that lay on the ground beside the bin with flies buzzing above them. Sometimes it's sweet. And here the girl stands in front of the glass case um, of an ice cream shop and where she is sampling ice cream from a small wooden sample spoon. And an arm extends over the top of the case holding a sample spoon with a different flavor of ice cream. It pitters and patters and drips and drains. And here the girl and her father um, shop for fresh fruits and vegetables outside, uh, outside uh, of an awning covered store. Uh, and there's a covered patio with a coffee shop next door where a person sits at a table reading a book and it's raining heavily with water pouring into the storm drain. It dings and dongs and here the girl and her father walk together down a stair, down a sidewalk and the girl carries the violin case. Her father has one hand on her shoulder and looks at his watch on his other wrist. and rattles and roars. And here the girl um, holds the back of her father's elbow as they ride a, an escalator down to a subway train. My city, my city speaks and whispers and giggles and sometimes meows. And the girl and her father sit on a crowded subway train. Uh, one person is knitting, another plays with a baby, Two people listen to music through earbuds. One person reads and one person has a cat in a carrier on their lap. My, uh, my city also speaks with hasty honks, impatient beeps, distant chimes, reliable rumbles, speedy sirens and urgent planes. And here the girl uh, holding the back of her father's elbow looks out across a traffic heavy road and in the background is a cargo ship on the ocean, an airplane taking off in the horizon and a clock tower reading three o'clock. My city speaks and here at a, an outdoor amphitheater, um, Near the ocean, there's many people gathered on the grass in front of the stage. As the girl uses her mobility cane and leads two children to the center stage where there are three chairs. All three children car carry violins. And sometimes it just listens. And now um, all the audience watches as the girl sits on the stage playing her violin. I wonder what my city will say tomorrow. And here there's a picture of the audience as they're all clapping and the girl is standing to hug her father who greets her on stage and her violin sits on the chair next to her. That is the end of My City Speaks. Well, thank you, Jen, that was wonderful. Um, Jen has shown us a dual media print braille book in action. And what I really like about this book is not only the, the wonderful audio imagery that is throughout, but that the pictures, um, the visual imagery is included with a description in braille. And the information is not too wordy. It provides important content for the listener. When reading a book, um, to a child with a visual impairment, it is really important to make sure that the information provided through the pictures is shared, as the words alone don't always tell the whole story. Um, another way um, for, for building these books is to, um, uh, and we'll go to the next slide, um, when um, 
is to use a story box. So a story box is a way of, of augmenting a book um, with items that are real items. So let's, for instance, it's, it's a box, a bucket, or a bag that, um, that are readily available. Um, they can be objects that are familiar to a, a child. Um, and you would want to make sure that the, the, the items that you're using are, for, for all intents and purposes, real items. For instance, if you were building a story box for a book such as A Very Hungry Caterpillar, it'd be great to have the real fruit pieces and not, not plastic replicas. So you want to choose a story that doesn't rely heavily on visually, visual experience or pictures and provides meaning to stories. And I, I have found that um, repeated line books work really well. So as I was saying, when building the story box, find corresponding items that go with the story. Um, dollar stores can be a good resource for sourcing items or collecting familiar objects um, from your home. And you know, books, it's really great when a child can read their own book or choose their own book and, and by identifying the cover and to add to your story box books, um, you would want to identify the box or the container that holds the, the real life items that are part of the story um, with a tactile representation. So the exterior of the container would have something that the child can feel. So. For instance, uh, Pete the Cat with his four groovy buttons, you might want to put four big buttons glued to the box. And um, when you are looking at building stories, you know, books are, are meant to be reread and, and read and reread. And uh, you could approach your, your book with that has a story box different ways. You may want to preview the story with the with the children, looking at the items in the box before you initiate the reading, or you, you may want to read the story to the children and as the items come up in the story and are being discussed in the, in the, in the um, progression, in sequence you would be giving those items out to the child to explore. Important thing is to allow ample time for the child to handle and figure out what the shape is through tactile exploration. And another thing, if you were rereading the story, you don't always need to present all the items in the box um, with each reading, maybe just select a few. So why do we have story boxes? Well, these provide, these real life item provides hands-on experience with real objects, and that can really help a child develop meaning to words and help them to develop concepts. There are lots of books that are used for story boxes and, and uh, to get a good idea of a selection of these, go to Paths to Literacy. This is a website, www.pathstoliteracy.org, story box ideas. And there, there's uh, several pages on that website that discuss story boxes and gives you ideas how to build them. Um, and another, um, Thing to, to look at it, there's just a slide here for if you give a mouse a cookie, um, a, it, and there's a picture showing a collage of items that would demonstrate what you would put in your story box. So a broom, scissors, crayons, empty milk carton from, um, and a, a glass with a, a drinking straw. So that just gives you a, a, an idea of what items that you might include. Um, and then another way to um, make libraries uh, inclusive uh, and moving away from a story box is building and using literacy kits. Now, many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with literacy kits as they're a pretty standard resource. These are kits that have been um, put together um, uh, along for themed story time. So it might be a selection of books that follow a central theme 
Um, and these sometimes these lit literacy kits can be checked out. When I was a teacher, I, I loved getting um, the literacy kits out for my students because it gave them a selection of books along a central theme and they could select their own book within that theme. So these lit kits can be easily adapted to be inclusive. Um, and I have given an example here on this page of a literacy kit based on the theme of transportation. And, and there are, these are books that are included um, that are dual media. So these are these print braille, braille print books that we've de uh, Jen demonstrated. Um, so there is a selection of books such as that. Um, you might want to also include a couple of audio print books. And as well as the print braille books that you can buy or purchase, um, you, there are books available in print braille from Nels and Sila. And again, there's a list on the screen showing these books. So um, literacy kits are, are really a, a wonderful way for families to take home um, uh, books that are geared for braille readers. Um, hard copy books that you purchased and loan books. Uh, there are several distributors for print braille books. And on this slide uh, coming up, I'm referencing places where you can purchase uh, print braille books, American Printing House, National Braille Press, Tactile Graphics in Canada and Seedlings Braille Books for Children are just a few of the um, organizations that sell print Braille books. They also are commercially available through some of our Canadian publishers, such as Kids Can Press is the um, producer of My City Speaks that Jen wrote. Uh, Groundwood Books uh, have three book titles here that are also in Braille. Um, already in our libraries and available for borrowing, of course, from uh, CELA, Centre for Equitable Library Access and National Network for Equitable Library Service. Um, NELS, we've, we've got um, books that can be given out to patrons um, through borrowing. So um, I, I, just before we move on, I'd like to direct you to one other place that I didn't mention on the slide is the Braille Bookstore. And that is where you can purchase something called a Braille labeler. And that is how you can produce uh, Braille to, um, I, to put on uh, the exterior of a lit kit. Um, so in summary here, there are some things to consider for a, a an inclusive story time. And the most important thing when, when thinking about an inclusive story time is, and I'll, I'll go to the next slide here, that you make sure that you have options for both print and braille readers. That would be awesome. Um, also thinking about um, sign language interpreters um, and lining them up ahead of time um, for your, your inclusive story time. Um, if you're going to use story box items, use physical objects that are meaningful for tactile exploration. And I really encourage you to use lots of use of image descriptions, um, giving those pictures more meaning by a brief and concise description. Books that include and promote inclusion and people with disabilities in a positive way are, are always welcome in an inclusive story time. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand things over to Kai and he is on, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna start by uh, demonstrating a Braille display, but before I do, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Kai, I'm uh, an accessibility analyst at NELS. Uh, I work on website and app testing, um, and I also work on a lot of tactile projects uh, with Braille, uh, tactile images, which we will talk about very shortly, uh, and uh, 3D printing. So I'm excited to be here uh, to talk to you about a lot of uh, different things in that area. Um, so I'm going to first, uh, I'm going to first, um, 
talk about what a screen reader is uh, because that's a relatively common piece of software that a lot of uh, blind and low vision users uh, would use. Uh, and what a screen reader is, um, is a software that will read what's on the screen, uh, whether that's text, uh, and announce uh, different types of controls, such as links and buttons. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, and we'll hear one in action. So uh, what you're hearing, uh, which might sound like gibberish to you, um, that is my screen reader. Um, and uh, it's basically reading at uh, about 1,149 words a minute. Uh, and I've trained myself to uh, hear that um, at that rate. Uh, but I will slow down the speech so that um, we can all hear what's going on. So here, let's go, to a, let's go to a web browser. OK, so here we are on start page, which is uh, my default search engine. And um, if I just uh, arrow through this page, you'll hear what I mean. One always on privacy protection at the Chrome. Button privacy, please. So you can hear that's a uh, button, uh, and then you can hear uh, what the text is for that button. Button navigation menu, clickable. Search, search landmark, search edit as auto complete. Start your private search. Button start so you search. can hear uh, the uh, search box and the search button. Uh, so um, that's basically what a screen reader is. Meeting controls, meeting controls window. So now I'm going to talk about a, a Braille display. Uh, we um, we do have one on the slide as well, which uh, we'll show briefly um, after this demonstration. Uh, that's a different model. Um, but the one I'll be showing you uh, in real time is the um, real display that I'm currently using to read these slides. And um, hopefully you can see uh, the little pins moving as I move around the Zoom screen. Um, and uh, you can see that there are little pins that move up and down. Uh, above this is a uh, what we call a Perkins style keyboard, where um, users can use these buttons to input text and also uh, navigate uh, around the computer that way, uh, or whatever device they have uh, the Braille display connected to, because it could be connected to um, a, uh, uh, a desktop, a laptop, mobile device. Um, so uh, yeah. So. Uh, one thing that uh, I, I do want to mention briefly, and you'll you'll hear this kind of throughout the uh, whole seminar, is that um, the screen reader is connected to a Braille display. You do need a screen reader to use one. Um, and uh, the speech output that uh, you hear from a screen reader uh, usually also gets translated uh, into Braille uh, using a refreshable Braille display if it's connected. Uh, so here, uh, now I'm going to talk about the uh, accessibility of uh, common reading apps. Um, one thing that's important to note is that for reading applications and websites to be accessible for screen reader users, the screen reader needs to be able to identify what's on the screen. For example, buttons, form fields, checkboxes, links, etc. Uh, and this is not only the responsibility of screen reader vendors, but the application and website developers as well. Developers do this by following common accessibility practices. For example, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, also known as WCAG. Uh, and companies also uh, will rely on manual testing uh, by persons with disabilities. Um, and a lot of experts recommend this uh, because WCAG is only a starting point and doesn't guarantee that the application or website is usable by disabled users. Uh, a small team of experts at NELS have tested some reading 
applications and websites. Uh, and some of the common problems that we've come across are uh, missing image descriptions, uh, unlabeled buttons and links, poor navigation, and limited uh, visual adjustment options. Uh, as a result, not all features are accessible, meaning that the product does not provide equitable access. So um, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about a couple of uh, highlights from some of our testing. Um, the first step I'll be talking about is Flipster, which is a magazine service. Uh, and some of the common problems on iOS, Android, and the website include uh, lack of visual adjustment options, uh, poor labeling of controls. So this might mean uh, that the screen reader user will only hear a button or they will uh, hear some sort of um, uh, text that's associated with the button, but it doesn't make sense. Um, and for this particular application, the text view is not set as a default. And so uh, unfortunately, screen reader users can't access the text unless they go in and change the mode every time uh, to text view. Uh, and note that the location of these problems differ for each platform. Um, so the next one is, Hoopla, uh, which I think most of you are familiar with. It uh, allows you to borrow videos, audiobooks, ebooks, um, uh, and I think those are the main content types. Uh, but some of the common problems for iOS include poor labeling of controls. Uh, so for both labeling, labeling of the shuffle and repeat buttons. Um, so we have the opposite uh, example where uh, some of these buttons have very uh, uh, very lengthy text. Uh, and so it takes longer to navigate through because you have to listen to all of that. Uh, and uh, another issue is navigation. Um, so lack of headings and the inability to access the reading controls uh, in the reader. Um, some problems with Android include uh, poor control labeling. Um, again, uh, we have overly verbose labels. Uh, navigation. Uh, so uh, in the specific instance, uh, controls disappearing quickly from the screen when playing videos. Um, and for uh, websites, this also includes poor labeling. Uh, so um, example is uh, some of the player controls, navigation, so access of di with dialogues and keyboard. Um, and uh, one of the things to point out is that with screen readers, uh, users generally rely on the keyboard. And when you can't access specific controls uh, on a website or app, uh, then uh, there's just no way to use that functionality, even if the screener is able to read those buttons. So navigation is, of course, very important. So what about Libby, uh, another very popular app uh, that provides ebooks and audiobooks uh, for users to borrow? So some of the problems uh, for the website, iOS, and Android platforms include uh, lack of visual adjustment options, again, poor labeling of controls, navigation challenges. Uh, so uh, the example I give here is incorrect uh, order of buttons. Uh, and so, for example, uh, logically, when you navigate through uh, in more of a linear fashion, you might have the uh, rewind play fa uh, fast forward or something like that. But when all that is out of order and you have uh, play and then fast forward and then rewind in that particular order as a user navigates, uh, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, and again, um, the uh, location of problems differ uh, between platforms. Uh, we know that Libby is working on an extensive update and uh, the Nels team of uh, experts will be testing upon release. Uh, and you can find more information about these and other apps that we've tested and will be testing uh, at uh, accessiblepublishing.ca uh, slash reading apps. So now let's talk about uh, STEAM, uh, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And uh, before I kind of talk about the uh, details and some of the adaptations, I want to share a little bit of background about uh, some uh, blind uh, uh, scientists um, and uh, some some uh, successfully employed blind people who 
work in these fields uh, because I think it's important to uh, know about them and all of them uh, are alive today. Uh, so uh, here I've, um, I will be sharing four, uh, but there are of course many, many more. Uh, so the first one is J. Vermeij, uh, who is a professor of geology and is an uh, evolutionary biologist and paleontologist. Uh, and he studies marine mollusks, both as fossils and as living creatures. Um, he has taught uh, animal diversity, evolutionary biology, ecology, marine ecology, uh, melancholy, uh, the mathematics and uh, physics of organic form, and a sem seminar on uh, extinction ranging from uh, the introductory to the advanced graduate level. Um, The next one is uh, Tim Cordes, uh, who is a practicing psychiatrist. Uh, he was the third blind medical student in the United States. Um, he was selected for one uh, out of one uh, one out of 140 spots uh, in the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and uh, Public Health from a pool of about uh, 2,300 applicants. Um, the uh, MD PhD program. Uh, that he went to afterwards is even more selective, admitting just uh, eight out of 200 applicants. Um, and he earned a PhD in biochemistry, making him one of the 193 blind and low vision scientists and engineers uh, in the US to uh, earn a doctorate. Um, so uh, another one that uh, I've had the pleasure of um, actually uh, talking to and meeting virtually is uh, Mona Mankara. Um, she is an assistant professor in the field of uh, bioengineering. Uh, her lab develops new computational models uh, and methods to obtain molecular level knowledge about surfactants, protein systems. Uh, and also she has a um, video series on independent travel uh, where she travels around the world uh, called Planes, Canes, and Trains. And actually that was how I first uh, learned about her. Um, Marco Madon, uh, he is a NASA engineer and project manager for NASA's space weather uh, following on SWFO uh, antenna network, uh, SAN. And um, this spacecraft uh, which is set to launch in 2025, is designed to monitor weather in space. Um, and uh, what I want to point out about all of these individuals is that all of these uh, um, all of these individuals are blind, and uh, they all find Braille to be uh, useful tools. Um, and the reason why I wanted to start with this uh, is because there is an underrepresentation of persons with disabilities uh, in STEAM fields, according to the National Science Foundation in the US. Uh, hence, uh, the need for organizations to offer more opportunities uh, in STEAM. So what can libraries do to uh, make these activities more accessible? Uh, libraries can provide more opportunities to engage uh, in STEAM uh, with certain activities by um, making them accessible non-visually. Uh, so um, some things to think about would be to encourage people to use uh, other senses rather than sight, uh, just sight to make observations. Uh, so think about the changes in odors from a chemical reaction uh, or encouraging tactile exploration. Um, make available tools to make STEAM more uh, accessible. So uh, Talking Lab Quest, uh, which is a tablet uh, or a device, handheld device that connects uh, sensor probes, that you can connect sensor probes to them and be able to uh, take measurements independently and uh, have them announced auditorily uh, and be able to uh, ultimately connect, uh, collect data. Uh, so Braille Caliper, which uh, will show a picture of um, very shortly, tactile drawing boards, um, et cetera. 
uh, include accessible books and materials that are STEAM focused, especially in Braille and with tactile graphics as part of your collection. Uh, include STEAM kits and toys adapted to be accessible as part of your collection. Uh, for example, one of my favorites is uh, Snap Circuits. Um, ensure that your makerspace is accessible uh, and uh, we'll be talking about that today. Uh, so I'll pass it over to Rian to uh, give a brief uh, picture description for the next few photos. Thanks, Kai. Um, this is a photo of a tactile or a braille tactile and braille caliper. Um, it is a uh, 30 centimeter long, only we're seeing a part of it, yellow uh, to ruler with um, two forks sticking out of the top and a sliding uh, yellow bar along the ruler part. Um, and it is measuring a piece of pipe. And there's a uh, braille that is along the top. And then there's also braille that kind of slides through pins uh, when the measuring tool itself is moved to round. And this can be purchased from several places, including Tactile Vision Graphics, Maxi Aids, National Braille Press, and the Perkins Shop. And then on this slide, we have tactile drawing boards. Um, we have a sensational blackboard pictured here um, with a piece of paper with a sun house and tree on a hill drawn and there's a regular ballpoint pen um, on top of everything. Um, so tactile drawing boards such as sensational blackboards, the Sewell drawing, raised drawing kit, uh, the draftsman, the tactipad and the intact sketch pad are great additions for your libraries. And Kai, over back to you. Thanks. So what are makerspaces? Um, makerspaces uh, are collaborative spaces in facilities such as libraries, schools, and other uh, private and public facilities that allow kids, adults to, kids and adults to build and share their own projects and gain hands-on experience with toy, uh, tools and STEAM concepts in a practical way. Uh, often, this contains equipment like 3D printers, CNC machines, laser cutters, sewing machines, uh, music instruments, and recording equipment, soldering irons, etc. Uh, but not all facilities have all these machines. Uh, some may only have a 3D printer. Uh, so, um, what are some things that we need to think about in making makerspaces uh, accessible, especially now that uh, we see more of them in schools and libraries and uh, even in a lot of homes now. So uh, the first thing to think about is the plan for universal access. Um, for example, uh, thinking about uh, ensuring that there's enough space for mobility devices to move around. Uh, but in terms of uh, looking at um, specific things for blind and visually impaired makers, uh, we want to think about uh, e making sure that the equipment is accessible as possible. Uh, so looking at the software uh, that works with visual enhancement software and screen readers, uh, controls on uh, hardware tools, uh, making sure that they are tactile. Um, and uh, also looking at the output from the hardware tools uh, that can be accessed accessibly. Uh, but the main thing to really take away uh, from this slide is to consult with disabled makers to learn what tools, techniques, and strategies allow them to be independent. And remember that not all people's needs are the same. Um, and also remember that some disabilities are invisible or are temporary. So don't assume that an accessible space is not needed. So um, we'll talk about 3D printing um, and kind of apply uh, some of the things that I talked about last slide uh, by looking at how uh, we can adapt 3D printing, uh, starting with uh, the process. So, um, the first step uh, in making 3D printing accessible uh, and in uh, 
fronting models is to either obtain or create the model. And um, if you are creating the model, um, you have to be aware that most CAD software is unfortunately inaccessible to screen reading software. However, there are accessible ways of creating them non-visually from scratch, such as using OpenSCAD, uh, which is a, a programming language that um, is text-based. So that makes it more accessible for uh, blind makers to be able to uh, create their own models. Uh, so the next step in this 3D printing process is uh, usually to slice the model. Uh, and we wanna be aware here also that a lot of slicing software is not very accessible with screen readers, uh, such as Kira uh, or Kura. However, um, the ones that I've tried uh, that do work pretty well is uh, uh, Slicer, which is spelled S-L-I-C-3-R um, and Simplified 3D. Um, so the next step then after you slice the model is to print the model. Uh, and here we want to consider purchasing printers that have tactile hardware controls. Um, so these could be uh, um, buttons that could be felt, or it could be a knob that clicks when you turn it. Uh, and um, looking at uh, um, printers that have no touch screens uh, and um, may also have uh, remote printing. Uh, which allows the user to independently access um, some of the functionality uh, from a computer. So um, this would be an example like Octoprint. Uh, and finally, looking at printers that have an open bed. Um, this is important because this allows the user to be able to uh, tactily uh, get feedback during the print. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this uh, in a second, more in a second. Uh, but if a printer uses a touchscreen, um, the uh, remote printing functionality may be able to bypass this barrier. Um, so touchscreens aren't completely out of the option, but you do want to make sure that there is um, remote uh, remote control functionality. Uh, so non-visual techniques are available for monitoring prints uh, in progress. Uh, so this would be uh, listening to um, uh, the rattle of uh, the filament, if there's loose filament, uh, this could mean uh, putting your hands on the print that the uh, nozzle isn't being worked on. Um, and uh, I, I don't recommend this for uh, users who are starting out 3D printing, but um, if once you get more comfortable with a 3D printer, uh, this is a valid and a, and a safe way to do it. So uh, if you see uh, a blind maker uh, doing this, uh, don't freak out. Uh, it's uh, it's totally fine. Finally, we have the step of uh, post processing. Uh, so here, um, this means uh, uh, painting the uh, model or sanding the model to remove some of the sharp edges. So we want to ensure that supplies like paint and uh, sandpaper are organized and labeled in braille, so that makers can find what they need on their own. Um, and we have more tips available uh, on the blind and low vision makers, uh, for blind and low vision makers uh, on the 3D model selection design and printing by people who are blind or visually impaired or who have low vision uh, roundtable website. Uh, and I was uh, um, honored to uh, have been able to contribute some tips uh, there as well. So, uh, next, let's talk about tactile graphics. Tactile graphics are particularly useful, especially in the STEAM field. Think about um, all the diagrams and uh, all the uh, pictures that are used to represent concepts and ideas. Um, so before we kind of talk about uh, their uses, let me take a step back and talk about what tactile graphics are. Uh, they are images that can be felt with the fingertips. Uh, and generally, they consist of raised lines, shading, uh, and textures. Uh, they can be, be useful for conveying spatial information, for example, charts, graphs, uh, diagrams, uh, in a concise manner where verbal or textual description alone may be inadequate. Uh, so 
tactile images can have the same benefits for blind readers as sighted readers to convey uh, concepts and ideas concisely. Uh, so to say to someone that, uh, oh, you know, you're blind, you don't need uh, tactile images or you don't need these images uh, could be doing them a disservice because they, uh, like myself, I, I'm a very uh, spatial learner. Uh, and so um, trying to rely on words alone uh, would be very difficult for me. Um, they can be produced in a variety of methods such as embossed, small touch, thermoform, collage, uh, and uh, of course with a 3D printer. Um, and I will uh, pass it over to Rianne to give a brief description. So here we have an example of swell touch. And this is, um, there's two pages here. The bottom left is a um, bar graph that um, shows different textures. Most of them have two different portions of textures per box and then an unshaded portion. And this is showing um, the makeup of muscle fiber types in different subjects. Um, so the horizontal bars, um, there's, I can't count that fast, eight of them. <laughs> and um, and they show the proportions of each texture and shade uh, differing in the length for each bar. And then there in the top right picture, there is a legend uh, with braille text and then little samples of each texture um, and letters corresponding um, to the braille labels to explain what each texture is. And Kai, back to you. Thanks. So there is a misperception that it's only used in education, uh, but it can be useful in other settings, uh, such as leisure. Uh, so think about fantasy maps, uh, coloring books, uh, picture books, etc. Um, and you know, we talk about the book famine uh, and uh, how there aren't a lot of accessible books. Um, we're kind of in the same situation here with tactile graphics. Um, there, and, and I think some of these reasons uh, might be because uh, people don't understand the importance of uh, tactile graphics. Uh, there might be a lack of training to uh, teach readers to interpret them successfully. Uh, and of course, there's poor design. So poor design makes images difficult to interpret uh, because it could be cluttered. Uh, they might not uh, have uh, well-placed labels um, in Braille. Uh, they might be missing uh, text descriptions uh, to provide the context for what you're looking at. Um, but one way to tackle this tactile graphics famine uh, is to increase the avail availability of well-designed images uh, in public libraries. Uh, so some books have tactile graphics in them or are made entirely of uh, tactile graphics. This is an example of a uh, print braille book with uh, graphics included. Um, and uh, I'll uh, pass it to Rian to give a brief description. Uh, so in this uh, title, this is how I know four tactile graphics are used to indicate the changing of the seasons. In this case, uh, Leaf is paired with a braille image description in both English and Ojibwe. So the reader knows the leaf is a fall orange color and the description is a leaf um, with a vein uh, through the center and a thick textured stem. And then there are small lines protruding from the outline of the uh, leaf itself um, because it's pokey. And uh, you'll notice in the tactile image uh, compared to the print image um, that there are fewer veins going through the, the leaf itself so that they're easy to discern as well as the little spikes coming out of the edge of the leaf itself. Um, there are fewer of them so that it doesn't become cluttered. And back to you, Kai. So uh, we've been talking a little bit about leisure with tactile graphics and you've just seen a book, um, but let's uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, Adapt adapting games. So traditional board games uh, are available for purchase or they can be adapted. Uh, and some games that have been made accessible uh, include playing cards, Uno, Crazy Eights, Checkers, Monopoly, uh, and others. Um, and uh, 
there are games though that are already accessible without any sort of adaptation. Uh, so um, some examples are Jenga, Dominoes, uh, and um, etc. And um, if you are adapting Braille or uh, if you're adapting these games, um, consider including Braille or tactile indicators uh, that can be put on the boards and uh, cards. And depending on the game, you may need to use uh, uh, textures as well. So think about game pieces such as uh, Connect 4. Um, you can adapt it by drilling a hole in the center of it uh, for one color to, to uh, identify it. Or uh, what I did growing up was uh, stick uh, Velcro on uh, one of the, uh, on only uh, the pieces that have a particular color. Uh, so what about video games? Video games can be made accessible through uh, text-to-speech by using screen readers and uh, audio cues. Uh, for example, Mortal Kombat, Sequence Storm, Hearthstone, Last of Us Part II. Um, and text-heavy games, of course, can be accessible to screen readers, uh, screen reader users, and by extension, Braille display users. Um, a database of games uh, that are accessible for uh, the blind and visually impaired uh, can be found at audiogames.net. Uh, one of the games that uh, we like to play a lot at Nels is uh, Jackbox Games, uh, which is a mainstream online uh, party, um, mainstream online games for uh, party partying. Uh, and um, some of them that uh, we found to be accessible is uh, Whiplash 3 and uh, Talking Points and Blather Round for Party Pack 7. Uh, in Jackbox Party Pack 8, Pole Mine, Job Job, and uh, Wheel of Enormous Proportions. Um, so uh, some really great stuff there. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Lori to talk about accessible clubs. Thanks, Kai. Um, so my name is Lori Davidson. I'm the Executive Director at CELA, the Center for Equitable Library Access. Um, so I'm going to do uh, an overview of how your library might be able to uh, think about in, uh, when you're offering book clubs to make them inclusive and accessible. Um, so there are many ways to make your book clubs inclusive, um, and you can use resources such as um, those from CELA as well as NELS to make your book clubs more inclusive. So the, the first thing always when you're thinking about a book club is to think inclusion first, um, and also to realize that book clubs do more for members than just discussing the book. Um, it allows members to learn new things through discussion. If you are reaching out and attracting uh, people to your book clubs that have a range of disabilities, the book clubs can offer peer support related to their disability. Um, and then there is also community involvement. Um, and this can lead to interest in services from other community organizations, such as the Canadian Council for the Blind, Braille Literacy Canada, or the CNIB. Um, so I'm going to go through four things to think about um, when you're thinking about accessible book clubs. The first is uh, getting started. Um, second, promoting and recruiting members. The third, choosing and getting books. And the last, we'll just go over some best practices for moderating the meetings. So to begin, we're going to talk about getting started um, with accessible book clubs and so some of the things to think about around time and meeting platform. Um, so one of the questions to ask yourself is what time of day works best for your members? Are you looking at attracting people who are available in the day or are the folks that you're attracting working in the day and might prefer an evening meeting? Um, you also want to consider whether you're going to be offering virtual book clubs or in-person um, uh, book clubs. If virtual, uh, you might want to consider what devices your members have, if they have computers, tablets, phone only. Um, if, the, if it is phone only, you want to consider about long distance charges and making sure that you've got a way of phoning into your virtual meeting that doesn't, um, that doesn't have long distance charges. Uh, you may want to consider in advance of your virtual meetings to provide training, particularly for those people who may not have experience with virtual meetings. And then you want to also, for your virtual meetings, set your guidelines um, about how you'll be using hand raising, chat, uh, will members be able to be unmuted and just be able to speak aloud. Um, it's also always a good idea to tell members to mute themselves while someone else is speaking. Um, many people will be using uh, screen readers and hearing screen readers can be distracting to the other members in the group. 
If it's in person, you want to think about choosing a location that is easy to get to by public transit and has accessible parking. You want to also make sure that there's elevator access and accessible washrooms, as well as um, making sure that there's room for guide dogs. Um, all of these things need to be considered when choosing a location. Uh, the room itself should be laid out with clear pathways uh, to chairs. If you're offering food, you want to make sure there's clear pathways to the food table for the, to the food tables, as well as clear pathways to the doors. So you want to be careful of any tripping hazards. And of course, considering space needs for wheelchairs, scooters, and walkers. The next um, to area to talk about is promotion, recruiting, and communications. Um, so obviously your aim is to have an engaging discussion so you need enough people to maintain it and you want people who come to your book clubs to to come back um, so you want to be able to make sure that all your communications are accessible offering them in multiple formats this is both online and print and can also include braille communications you want to be able to promote your club on um, the library or your group's website, um, as well as emails and all social media. And if you are promoting it in any of these places, if you're using any images, you want to make sure that you include image descriptions for all of those ways of promoting. You want to reach out uh, to organizations in your community that support people with disabilities. Um, making sure that for meeting notices and reminders all all of that should include your link to your, your zoom or call in phone numbers or the physical address if you're offering in person and of course you want to within your library or organization assign someone to keep all of the members contact information up to date and to make sure that you take attendance as well when the when the book club is um, actually being run the third area is about choosing and getting books. Um, so there's different approaches that you can take as a club organizer. You could choose books yourself. You may want your members to vote, or maybe each member recommends a title. You could use a reading program like Canada Reads. Um, it's a good idea to set books six months or a year ahead of time. This gives everybody lots of time to get copies in the format that they need. So sometimes the availability of accessible formats can take a while to get to get produced and so you want to make sure that people have that lead time to be able to get their hands on the format that works for them. It's also true uh, that checking the availability of a format is a good idea so that they're to make sure that they are available in, in accessible formats because that might be um, a part of the process about what titles you can choose. You want to always present a range of formats in your book clubs. Um, so certainly for pe various people with print disabilities, they may have their preferred format, but also other people uh, with other disabilities and even with invisible disabilities may choose to read in other formats besides regular print. So don't, don't assume that regular print is always the format that people choose. You want to make sure that Braille or eBraille is offered, CD or downloadable audio. Uh, e-text word or epub again uh, you want to make sure that these are as accessible as possible and then for print copies um, large or enlarged print um, um, are good uh, for available formats as well as um, offering regular print um, equipment that some of your users may be using and of which um, you may as a library want to uh, supply to your users could include uh, braille displays like the kind that Kai um, showed in his demonstration, uh, daisy players for reading audiobooks in the daisy format, and if possible you want to provide training to your users on this equipment. Um, and for members with print disabilities, um, you want to check uh, Sela and Nels's collections for accessible uh, formats to get uh, to, so that your users can get uh, their hands on the uh, format of their choice. And finally, I'm going to talk about best practices for running meetings. So if the meeting is in person, it's a good idea to have a door greeter to guide people to their seats. Um, keeping in mind that some people with low vision prefer to sit with their backs to the windows to avoid glare. Um, you always want to make sure that you um, inform people in the room where snacks and drinks are and where to find them. Um, and also um, telling people in the room when someone is leaving the room or when they come back so that people know who's, um, who's, in, who's in the room um, for discussion. Uh, in virtual meetings, like I said at the beginning, you want to make sure that you explain all your meeting guidelines, such as hand raising, how to mute, what controls to use, how to ask questions so that everyone's clear um, on the process. For chairing the meeting, you want to make sure you do a roll call um, and have everyone say their names so everyone knows who is there. If it's in a physical space, um, you want to make sure that for members with vision loss that they know who is seated on either side of them. 
Um, obviously, the chairperson's role is to move the meeting along, um, to ensure participation from everyone, and to also be a timekeeper. Um, you may want to consider inviting guest speakers like an author. And of course, at the end, thanking everybody. If the chairperson is someone other than, um, than the organizer, thanking the chairperson, thanking all the members for attending. And also keep in mind that when you have um, people uh, who are coming uh, to book clubs that may be reading in other formats, um, uh, they, there may be lots of discussion, not just about the content of the book, but there may be discussion around the narrator of the book, the quality of the braille transcription, um, and also discussions about the uh, image descriptions in the book. So the, um, the content of book discussion can be uh, much, uh, much wider and more diverse when you've got a more diverse membership within your book clubs. So that's what I wanted to um, cover with, uh, uh, with running accessible book clubs. Um, I'm now gonna hand it over to Rianne to talk about uh, resources for new adult Braille readers. Thanks, Lori. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Rianne. I'm the Braille and Accessibility Testing Coordinator at uh, NELS, and I wanted to share with you some resources for new um, adult Braille readers. So Braille Literacy Canada recognizes that learning Braille as an adult or an older adult can be a challenge. So they've created an amazing free program called the Braille Zoomers Program, which is a monthly virtual peer support get together for adult and older adult Braille learners. So new Braille Zoomers can even apply for a starter kit of really cool things to get started on their Braille journeys. And some of these would be great to have in libraries too. Um, we'll go through kind of the contents of, of that kit here uh, right away. But for more information, we invite everyone to email info at blc dash lbc.ca or visit the Braille Literacy Canada website. Um, so some of the items that are in the Braille Zoomer starter kit that would be excellent for um, libraries would be the Dymo Braille labeler, uh, Braille playing cards, um, Braille flashcards, a slate and stylus, a Braille eraser, um, a Braille box with pegs, um, some Braille paper, a UEB symbols booklet, um, the book called Just Enough to Know Better, um, another book called Super Short Stories and Uncontracted Braille, and um, also New Year's just get a, a Braille Literacy Canada bookmark with information about it. Um, and those are always useful things to have in your libraries. Um, all of these items, I believe, can be purchased through National Braille Press. Um, I think Braille Superstore has a number of these items as well. Um, and Canadian Assistive Technology has some of like the labelers and things like that. And I'll turn it back to Lori to talk about accessing Braille from CELA. Great. So to end with, um, Rianne and I are just going to talk about how to access Braille from um, both CELA and NELS. Um, so CELA offers a collection. We have about over 11,000 uh, Braille titles. That's both books and magazines. Um, and this is for all ages and reading um, interests. Uh, the CELA collection we produce in uh, UEB and we include both contracted and uncon uncontracted Braille titles. Almost all of the CELA co um, collection titles are human transcribed Braille. Uh, so that they will read well. Um, so not only if they're embossed and uh, printed out, or they will read well with a refreshable Braille display. Um, in addition, as part of our collection, we offer the Bookshare collection, and uh, Bookshare provides about 850,000 plus titles and growing um, in EPUBs and eText. Um, and but Bookshare's uh, Braille is um, automatically transcribed Braille, um, so it's not human transcribed. We also offer physical Braille that can be mailed uh, to our users. This is embossed Braille that will be mailed to your boxes to your home. Um, and uh, we also offer eBraille, of course, which allows you to download a file and you can um, either use that um, uh, using direct to, our direct to player download mode and then read it with a Braille display. In terms of print Braille from CELA, we have about 1400 uh, picture books for children. These are all in uncontracted Braille. Um, our print bearer collection is a circulating uh, collection and users of CELA can, bar can uh, request and have these materials sent out to them directly and then they're returned back. Um, uh, and uh, this, uh, this is a really great way of like if you're using print braille in story time, if you, um, if you want to use print braille in any um, of your book clubs, um, you can um, encourage users to get books in this way. We get our uh, Braille, CELA gets our Braille from a number of sources. We work with CNIB's Beyond Print Department to do original um, human transcribed Braille production. 
We also get a number of Braille files exchanged through the Marrakesh Treaty. So these are with international partners. And we're now um, about to begin adding a, a huge number of Braille titles through NLS, which is the National Library Service in the United States that services people for, uh, with print disabilities. Um, and we also get French print Braille titles through our exchange with BANQ um, in Quebec. And um, also just to note that for those in Quebec, um, SQLA, the service of BANQ offers French Braille and there'll be more information on that um, in, the, in the next session on January 20th, which is um, if you're interested in Braille resources for French, um, for French readers of all ages. Now, um, now I will pass it over back to you, Leanne. Thanks. Uh, so accessing Braille from NELS um, can be uh, accessed in two main ways, digitally through the NELS repository at NELS.ca, um, but also physically through any public library, either um, at the public library itself or through interlibrary loan, and that's any public library in Canada. Um, all of the NELS Braille titles are human transcribed and are in either contracted or uncontracted Braille and in French or English. Um, and most of our Braille titles come from working with publishers to produce new titles at the same time as uh, print publication. Uh, we have poetry, plot your own stories, young adult, adult fiction, nonfiction, some recipes and cookbooks, uh, print Braille, tactile graphics, and much more. And again, a lot of those can be accessed uh, through your public library, through interlibrary loan, and from the NELS repository. Um, all NELS EPUB titles can also be read on a Braille display. Uh, users can request titles for production as well. And uh, NELS also has a recommendations list for Braille display purchases for your library, and that can be found at nels.ca slash library hashtag technology. Um, so a little bit of a summary of um, public libraries in Braille. So libraries may borrow Braille titles or download eBraille titles for their patrons or for use in their library. Um, and they can highlight um, to their communities that they have access to a Braille collections. Um, they should encourage all staff that, um, and that they're encourage that all staff are made aware of the availability of Braille content at their library and how to access it from other places. Um, they can create Braille signage and include Braille labels on audiobooks and movies, especially those movies with audio descriptions. Um, libraries can help promote access to Braille to schools. Um, they can include Braille activities and programming such as story time, STEAM, etc. They can run inclusive book clubs and uh, they can support adult Braille learners by reaching out to Braille Literacy Canada and pointing them in the right direction, as well as having uh, Braille support um, materials in their libraries. And if you're looking for more opportunities to learn about making your library more accessible, you can visit accessiblelibraries.ca for more information. So on behalf of Braille Literacy Canada, the Canadian Council of the Blind, the CNIB Foundation, the Center for Equitable Library Access, the National Network for Equitable Library Service, and the Provincial Resource Center for the Visually Impaired, thank you for celebrating World Braille Day with us. We're gonna stop the recording and allow for a short answer period. Um, and I'm gonna stop the recording now.